Welcome to the show. Adam Azer and Dave Richard here. Hey, Dave. Adam. Happy Super Bowl week. It's here. All it's right. the all red everything Super Bowl. Are yeah. You, are you ready for ready? a possible huh. wings eating contest on now? Oh. Twitch on Super Bowl Sunday? I'm ready for a wing eating competition at any hour of any day. All right. I've, I've challenged Dave. We're going to be on Twitch uh, for some pregame talk and uh, also during the well, I'll give you the full schedule at some point this week, but we're going to be doing some pregame stuff on Twitch. And uh, I challenge Dave and Frank Stample to a wings eating contest. So if we're on for an hour and we just have to see casually how many we can eat in an hour, if that's the contest, what kind of wings would you be picking? I'm probably going to go somewhere along the line of either hot wings or barbecue wings. Those are usually my two go-tos. Although I do know a place that's got really good, like just marinated wings yeah. with, with like cooked onions and stuff. It's an Italian place around oh, here called Anthony's. Oh, it's Anthony's. Really oh my gosh. The best wings. Yeah. Those wings are very, very good. They're just different than your typical type of wing. And then there's also a place that's got good garlic parm wings yeah. in town. So I'm not sure. I might have to go with a variety. And I'm and I'm not quite sure how many do I do I buy one hundred or two hundred wings. I'm gonna have to think about <laughs> I was that. Thinking like twenty four for me that maybe I could pull that off in an hour. Uh, but uh, oh, and then I'm gonna win. This is yeah. Great. <laughs> well, probably you know I'm gonna be hosting, so I have to talk more. Anyway, um, I as, as we as we get into Super Bowl week, I mentioned this on Fantasy Football today in five. I'm starting to feel the Tampa Bay Bucks a little bit here. I believe the line is now down to three. Um, is at three and a half. I, that's what I think. I, right now, I'm going to pick the Chiefs by three. And uh, what but, would change your mind? What would possibly change your mind at this point? Because you said right I now I'm going to pick know. the Chiefs at three. Well, but at first, I was like Chiefs by 10. The fact that they're, that they're beat up on the offensive line, I don't like it at all. Um, no, it's usually a bad thing. The fact that Vita <laughs> Vea is, going to, is playing, and he played 46% of the snaps against the Packers, that was a season low. So I would think he could be back with two extra weeks now. I would think he could be back to close to uh, his typical snap share, and you're talking about one of the premier defensive tackles in football. They don't need to run the ball the mm, Chiefs to wow. be good. Well, run stuffers he is. He, he's, he's very good to call him one of the premier guys. I mean, maybe he's there already. Maybe. I, well, I, when he got hurt, I believe he was ranked by Pro Football Focus as one of the top run run stuffers in football. Um, the Chiefs don't need to run to be successful, but you'd like <laughs> that's good them, because they don't. You'd like to see them be able to run a little bit, have a little bit of running game. I don't think they're going to have much of a running game at all. Um, oh, so, so they're going to have to about, rely on Mahomes. You're talking oh, about darn. hey, listen, you're talking about Mahomes, but you're talking about Mahomes with a beat up offensive line now where the, with no ability perhaps to run the ball successfully here because the, uh, the bucks were allowing like 2.3 yards per carry to running backs with Vita Vea, the first six games of the season. So now you can just tee off. Now you can just send the pass rush here and um, you're not going to stop him, but I think you could make enough big plays where, uh, you know, you limit them a little bit. You know, the bucks outscored the chiefs. Uh, sorry. They had a, uh, a better point differential this year. So there's a lot to like about Tampa Bay in this spot. And I think Brady will play better in warmer weather because he's been under 56% completion percentage in all three of his postseason games. One of them was in a dome, but I think uh, not being in the cold will help that a little bit. So that's where I'm at, Dave. I've just, I see some opportunities here for the Bucks to win this game. There's no question. They've got opportunities to do so. First of all, the weather, there's apparently a big cold front coming down. I know that there's snow all over the Northeast and, it's pushing cold weather into Florida. It's not supposed to be that warm for the game on Sunday. Uh, there's a chance the weather could be in the 50s. So we'll see. I, you know I me. I never like to really consider weather until pretty much game time anyway. Um, but the offensive line is absolutely an issue for Kansas City. But Andy Reid can, has worked around that. He's basically worked around it all season. Their guard play hasn't been very good. And Mahomes can work around that as well. There are many different ways that Kansas City can scheme up to take away and negate and limit that pass rush. The Bucs would just have to be on fire getting to Mahomes to really throw him off his game. So I, I, I still think Mahomes is the cure-all for Kansas City. And I think Steve Spagnuolo can do some things on defense to get the pass rush to Brady. Brady really, he's been very hot and cold. 
throughout the, his last two playoff games, and uh, especially the last one. I mean, the, the second half against Green Bay, you know, they, they tried to gift the yeah. win to Green but Bay, and they couldn't do it. How good was he? How good was he down the stretch in the regular season? I mean, he, he was great. And, and listen, there were moments in the Green Bay game, uh, th- that little mini drive at the end of the first half, where he threw that strike to Scotty Miller. I, I'm not taking anything away from Brady. I'm not saying that Brady's even remotely bad, but he's had some some moments where you go, oh, what's going oh, on? Yeah. No, he's going to have to play better. He against has Kansas to City play flawlessly. Green Bay. Period. End I don't of story. know if he has to play flawlessly. I think but. he does. If the Tampa Bay is going to win, I think he's got to, he cannot turn the ball over. He's got to be super accurate with 95% of his passes. And I also no, think if you want to no, talk about a run game, I think, I think you need the Bucks run game to come through. I think they need to yeah. be a little bit more balanced than we've seen from them over the course of the year. So we'll, we'll, we'll see what they do, but I'm, I'm excited for the game. I think it's going to be very entertaining and I, I agree with you. I think Kansas city wins, but I think they win somewhere between three and seven points. Okay. Uh, so it is super bowl week. So here's what we have for programming. We've got this episode today where we'll talk a little bit about the senior bowl and some 2020 notes, some things that caught my eye, including David Montgomery's last two games, Josh Jacobs role, uh, Deandre Hopkins splits with a healthy Kyler Murray versus with Kyler Murray, Kyler Murray dealing with the shoulder injury. DJ Moore, DJ Moore has 10 touchdown catches on 335 targets in his career. So we'll talk about that and a few other things. Um, some news and notes. We'll talk a little bit more about the, the blockbuster trade in case you missed our bonus podcast on Saturday night. But this week we have an early free agency preview. We have, um, Hopefully some player interviews from Tampa because we do have Jamie and Heath and some other guys there in Tampa. Hopefully we'll get some uh, player interviews. DFS picks with Mike McClure. You'll hear that. Player props with Liz Loza. You'll hear that. So those are going to be episodes in this feed, Ben. Yeah, so those will be in this feed Wednesday and Thursday. Okay. And um, a Super Bowl preview with some DFS and some props. That'll be a Friday episode. And then you'll hear the pick six preview of it that crossover will uh will, you know will air their episode in our feed on saturday um let's do the news and notes here dave the yeah anything else to say about the rams and the lions or maybe for the people who didn't hear it let's sum it up so it's stafford going to the rams golf going to the lions and the lions also getting two future first round picks and a third round pick and the rams do not have a first round pick until 2024 the rams according to nfl network are going to take in Two years and $43 million on Stafford's contract. The Lions are going to take four years and $106.6 million on Goff's contract. And uh, that's a lot of money. Yeah. I mean, but, yeah, go ahead. I, I have gotten a lot of flack for saying that the Lions didn't get enough. And it's really going to come down to where those picks end up in 2022 and 2023 and how Goff does for them. But I almost feel like one of the first round picks that they got was just to eat the golf contract. And I, there's talk that, oh, golf isn't going to be a bridge quarterback for the Lions. We'll see. Uh, he, he wasn't very good down the stretch for the Rams. He, he had a nice completion percentage, but I, I think he's kind of lost his mojo a little bit and maybe he can find it in Detroit. I don't know. I, I, I think getting Stafford is exactly what the Rams needed to do, certainly to get off of golf in that contract. And they don't really care about their first round picks. I don't expect those first round picks to be valuable. Uh, I saw that Carolina offered a package to the Lions for Stafford that included the number eight overall pick. And I thought to myself, well, what else was in that package? And would that be worth it? Would that be a better offer than what the Rams offered? And I guess the answer is no, because the Lions just, they know they're rebuilding. But I'm just, I, I, I think that the Lions just really... I don't know if they, I don't think you can call it settling, but I don't think it's anything to be super excited about that they got these future first round picks when they're not this year's draft, next year's draft, and they could be back half of the first round. They could be toward the end of the round one if the Rams make the Super Bowl again. So we'll see. We'll I, see. Okay. I, I do think the Rams won the deal. Yeah, I definitely think the Lions won the deal because, you know, and I, I could see you being right. It's probably just a matter of how much better is Stafford than Goff. I think he's better. But maybe sure. you can find something in Jared Goff. That, this guy two years ago was better than Matthew Stafford. The last two years haven't been so good for, uh, for Goff. But he went to the Super Bowl and he looked like a rising star quarterback. Now, I trust Sean McVay to get the most out of a quarterback, so it's probably on Goff and not on the coaching staff or anything. But maybe you can salvage something there. Maybe he won't be as, uh, that bad. He's obviously a lot younger. He's, he's been healthier. Stafford's been dealing with injuries three years in a row. 
um, back injuries, like serious injuries too. So I, it's risky. And I just think that the Rams are not in the position to be trading away all these first round picks. They keep trading away first. They're round going picks. for it, but that's what they're good doing them, is. Well, yeah, of course it's good for them. Yeah, they're trying I, I to win did, a Super Bowl, and the Lions are basically admitting Bowl. that they're going nowhere for the foreseeable future. I don't know because they just got a starting quarterback back. I mean, that's the thing. They got Jared Goff back. He's not terrible, right? He's he's not like can you one of the worst. Can you place him in? Can you name 20 other quarterbacks you'd rather have on your team? I was thinking the off the top right of my head, he's probably like the 20th best quarterback. So you pick that. I think, I think I can name 20. I yeah, think he's, he's in that bottom 12. Right, but he's not that bad. Five. <laughs> All right, so, bad. Well, I did a Twitter poll. Who won the trade? 3,000 votes. 61% said the Lions won the trade. Okay. Uh, I did also a Twitter poll. Are the Rams legitimate Super Bowl contenders next season with Stafford? And it was almost the same. In fact, it was. 61.4% said, yes, they are. So um, that was uh, 2,100 votes. So Interesting um, results. Yeah, both of them were 61%. Said, said the Lions won the trade, but the Rams are legit Super Bowl contenders. I guess Okay, both- so maybe both. Oh. Listen, listen. If the Rams go to the Super Bowl and win it, obviously, but even if they make it that far, and the Lions rebuild goes well and they get something out of golf, it's a win-win for both teams. We just don't know yet. Now let's talk fantasy. We haven't really done that much the first 11 minutes of the show. How much of a boost is it for Stafford? And would you rather have Matthew Stafford or let's say a guy who really came on strong at the end of last year? I mean, he was awesome. And he finished number 11, Kirk Cousins or Matthew Stafford. I think if I wanted to make a value play based on those two, I would aim for Cousins because I think I can get Cousins with my very last pick in a draft. I don't think there's going to be any excitement or buzz to get him on a fantasy roster, and there will be some buzz for Stafford. Neither one are top 12 quarterbacks. Okay, but who you're going to rank ahead, Stafford? Stafford will probably be ranked ahead of Cousins by maybe three or four spots. Matt Ryan or Matthew Stafford? Ryan. Uh, Baker Mayfield or Stafford? I'll probably say Stafford. Okay. And we did not talk about Van Jefferson on the Saturday bonus podcast. Do you have any thoughts on him? Does, does he... Get on your radar at all? I, I, I love the talent. I'm just concerned about the amount of targets he'll get when he's in an offense with Robert Woods and Cooper Cup. And so at best, he'll be the number three receiver. I, we, we assume that they'll move on from Josh Reynolds. I believe he's a free agent. I'm not 100%. I can double check on my... The report receiver. was that they were going to move on from him and Gerald Everett. Right. So if those guys are out, then that could open up maybe 75 to 80 targets for Jefferson in 2021. I mean, he, he needs he would need an injury to Woods or Cup in order to to be a viable consider consideration for fantasy lineups next year. But I love him. I think he's a great slot receiver. I think he's got all kinds of good potential. I'd love to have him on my dynasty teams. And another interesting thing here is what does the Rams offense look like in terms of the vertical passing game? Because they they didn't really have that last year. Jared Goff's intended air yards per attempt was six point six. Very, very low. Stafford's been at his best recently when he's been throwing the ball downfield. Do the Rams have the personnel for that? Do they add someone? Um, you know, we'll see how it develops. Would you rather have Cooper Cup or Robert Woods? Would you rather have either of them over DJ Moore? I think I'd rather have... I th- Cup's going to be third on that list. To me, it would go back and forth between Moore and Woods, but the fact that McCaffrey will be back probably makes me want to have more or less. That sounded kind of funny. Uh, Woods, Woods would be first on the list. And I think he does have an opportunity to be a little bit. I, he and Cup can both play downfield. They're just not burners in the true sense. And the Rams are probably going to find somebody along the way that's got some downfield speed. That would be bad for Jefferson and potentially bad for all the other pass catchers in L.A. Okay, and we'll see if uh, Kenny Galladay stays put. But how much are you downgrading him? It, are you downgrading him behind the Rams wide receivers if he's there with, uh, with Jared Goff? You know, we did see... Woods and Cup put up good numbers with Goff in L.A., but I, I wonder how much of that is just a byproduct of Sean McVay scheming it up the right way and utilizing Goff properly. We know that Anthony Lynn is not Sean McVay when it comes to play calling. Probably going to be a run-centric offense. I'm really excited about what it means for DeAndre Swift, and I'm, I'm, I'm optimistic about Hawkinson, too. If Galladay's there, I'd be nervous to trust him like we did last year. Trust where we just Hawkinson or Galladay? Uh, Galladay. Okay. 
he he probably should not be considered a top 12 receiver in Detroit with Jared Goff and Anthony Lynn. All righty. A couple other news items, a few more. Ben Roethlisberger willing to take a pay cut to stay with Pittsburgh. Tennessee promoted tight end coach Todd Downing to offensive coordinator. He was the Raiders coordinator in 2017. What did we establish yesterday? They ran the fewest plays in the NFL that year. Third third fewest fewest plays. Fewest. Yeah, which, by the way, is what Tennessee ran in 2019. They ran the third fewest plays in the NFL. They more more. uh, They were kind of average in 2020. Do you have a thought on this on Todd Downing, Titans offensive coordinator? I'm sure he's going to go into it thinking if it ain't broke, don't fix it. The team's made the playoffs each of the past two seasons. They've done it with, you know, clever play calling, lots of good play action and leaning heavily on Derrick Henry. I would imagine it's going to be more of the same. Okay. And why would he change that? Why would he? No. Why would you do that? Green Bay will not bring back defensive coordinator Mike Pettin. And here's a funny quote I read on CBSSports.com. Jay Gruden was talking about, he was former coach of the Washington now football team. Uh, he was talking about a guy named Kyle Smith, who was a Washington vice president of player personnel. And now he's with Atlanta. And it was, he was talking about the NFL draft and their evaluation process with Washington. So Gruden said, um, every year that I was there, we had a pretty good draft class with a couple exceptions. Uh, he said this to the Washington Post, I believe. Uh, Kyle Smith was really good about listening to the coaches because the coaches also did evaluations. When it came our time to pick, we'd always talk about the picks, where we'd like to go, what happens if the player is gone and did all our scenarios. And then Daniel Snyder would come in off his yacht and make the pick. (laughs) No, That's, that's Dwayne Haskins. That's so candid, you know, like it's, that's just, it is. Wow. That don't, don't meddle, Dan Snyder. Let your football guys do the do their job. Well, hopefully that's happening now. Well, it is Super Bowl week. If you're wondering how to watch Super Bowl 55, you can watch the game for free on CBSSports.com and the CBS Sports app on your phone and your connected TV devices or with your CBS All Access subscription. And you can watch the game for free. CBSSports.com, CBS Sports app. CBS All Access. The biggest sporting spectacle of the year is nearly upon us. We know everyone loves making their picks. So if you're a diehard fan or if you're just tuning in for the big game, we think you're going to love this opportunity to enter the CBS Sports football props game. This is your chance to compete for a $1 million jackpot. $1 million if you correctly answer all of the football props questions. There's a guaranteed $50,000 to the winner. You can win all that money without risking anything. Football props is free to play. Just visit cbssports.com slash props or download the CBS Sports app to enter and we'll put the episode, we'll put the link in the episode description, but you're just going to go to cbssports.com slash props. Something else I noticed, Dave, tell me what you think about this. Hmm. Um, someone we work with posted a graph on Twitter of pay TV I guess subscriptions or viewing time or something uh, and non pay TV. And the, the the gap is, is getting narrow, right? Between like pay TV and non pay TV. And this guy that we work with wrote, the streams are about to cross. This guy is also Adam and I's boss. (laughs) And then Ben Strager liked the tweet, but I know he doesn't get that reference about crossing the streams. So, you know, like, what do you think about someone liking a tweet but not even getting the joke? Well, he's just supporting his boss. <laughs> Wants his boss to know, hey, I'm with you all the way. Click that like. I think regardless of the reference, it's a funny line. I don't even know what it's from, but crossing streams is hilarious. It's, it's from Ghostbusters. Uh, yeah. Cross the streams. All right. Things that caught my eye in 2020. David Montgomery's last two games were interesting, Dave, because he was on this mega run where he was uh, the number in the last six games of the year, his last six games. He was, uh, I think, the number one running back in fantasy, actually, or number two per game. He had to have been. He had 19 or more PPR fantasy yeah. points in each of the six. And Number two in non-PPR, number one in PPR. I think Derrick Henry was ahead of him in, uh, in non-PPR. But those last two games, the matchups got a little bit tougher. I'll get into that a little bit more with with the specifics. And he had a great game against Green Bay, but not per carry. I mean, 22 carries for 69 yards. That's that's the old David Montgomery, but he did score a touchdown and he had nine catches. 
Then at New Orleans, the following week, 12 carries for 31 yards. So it was an interesting end. That was a playoff game. It was an interesting end to the season for David Montgomery, who does end up as the number four running back in non-PPR, number six in PPR for the season. And I believe he'll be one of the most difficult draft day decisions. What do you think? I think you should not rate him or rank him based on those last six games because they were great. They were outstanding. The bears fed him the football. They found ways to get him the football. That's what they did not do in their playoff game against new Orleans. They decided to ride on the arm of Mitchell Trubisky. That worked out well. Um, He averaged almost 25 PPR points in his final six games. Most of that was also against weak competition. It wasn't tough defenses like new Orleans, like green Bay, his first nine games, you know what he averaged PPR points in his first nine games of the year, Adam? Uh, I know he was 26th in PPR per game and 32nd in non-PPR, so I don't know what he averaged, though. 11.3 PPR points per game. And now Cohen's going to come back. You can't forget about Tariq Cohen. He signed and, and an extension way, with the Bears. So let's take those two numbers, right, for all of you that don't really know what that means. Like, How do you put that into how, – how does that compare? 11 fantasy points per game in PPR – that made him 26th per game. So that's just not good enough from a starter uh, at, at running back on your team. Like you need more than 11 PPR fantasy points uh, to, to, you know, say a guy's a must start for sure. And obviously the inverse is true when you've got a guy getting, you know, 25 PPR points per game. That's really, really good. I always like to use 15 points in PPR as a baseline for a running back or a wide receiver. If you're averaging 15 PPR points, that's good. I'll take it. Awesome. When you're way above that, you're a superstar. And when you're below that, you're replaceable to a degree. It depends. You know, you could, maybe you look at them at a, a different tier or two below. I guess I shouldn't say replaceable. Um, in 2020 with Tariq Cohen, he averaged 16.3 touches per game. It was 16.7 with Cohen in 2019. In three games with Tariq Cohen in 2020, one 100 total yard game, no rushing touchdowns, one receiving touchdown, six catches in those three games. I, I think Cohen being back along with uh, it should happen to Chicago, a change of quarterback. They were in on this Matthew Stafford Derby. They want to improve at that position. I think it'll alter how David Montgomery does. He can be good. He's going to be a top 20 fantasy running back, but not a top 12 guy. Yeah. His last six games, he faced every opponent he faced finished the season 27th or worse against running backs, okay? So he faced nothing but the bottom six opponents in terms of fantasy points allowed to running backs. Now, one of those was Green Bay. He faced them twice. He faced them in the first of those six games and the last of those six games. So this is where you have to look at it and say, you kind of, you kind of have to, see, how willing are you to say that Green Bay was a good matchup the first time he faced them and he torched them and a kind of a bad matchup the second time. Green Bay's run defense did get a lot better. Are you willing to say that? You know, that's 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 up to you guys. I I kind of am. I, and, I agree with you. And like I said, he put up a lot of fantasy points against Green Bay in week 17, but he didn't run very well. He didn't. He wasn't very efficient, at least 22 carries for 69 yards and a touchdown. And he also had nine catches. I mean, you'll take anybody that gets 22 carries in a game sure. and then you tack on nine catches on top of that. And of course, you're going to have good fantasy production if you're getting the ball that much. All right, let's go to the next thing that caught my eye. It was Josh Jacobs, who, you know, I just felt as a, as a Josh Jacobs manager, I just felt like I wanted more. And it's the guy who finished as a top eight running back, but he did have 12 rushing touchdowns. He led the NFL in red zone carries and carries inside the 10 yard line. He was fifth in carries inside the five yard line. And more importantly, Dave, to me, he had 78.3% of his team's carries inside the five yard line. That was second only to James Robinson. So you love the goal line role. For Josh Jacobs. And if the Raiders are going to score a touchdown on the ground, it's probably going to be Josh Jacobs. Um, so what do you think about that? Would you rather have Montgomery or Josh Jacobs going in? And, uh, you know, your overall thoughts on a guy who finished top eight. I'd rather have Jacobs. And the, the problem with Jacobs in 2020 was that he was very inconsistent. And you, you mentioned he finished eighth in PPR points. That's raw total PPR points in 2020. He was 14th in PPR points per game, and he was 21st in consistency in terms of games with 15 plus PPR points. He only had five. So that just the, the, the up and down nature of Josh Jacobs made him frustrating. I think that's why you're a frustrated Josh Jacobs fantasy manager. 
And the Raiders, just did, they didn't do a great job running the football. Jacobs was a big part of that. Of course, he was successful in terms of getting those touchdowns. That's huge for fantasy. And I think he had 1,300 total yards at the end of the season. Those numbers look good, but they weren't spread out. He didn't get you a touchdown per game. Um, no. And he I, had three I, in week one. And right. It so, was kind of a letdown. Yeah. So it, kind of a roller coaster. What would need to change? I think that offensive line needs to get a little bit more reinforced. They have some really good interior linemen. They're older. I'd like to see them get a little bit stronger there. I'd like to see him commit to Jacobs more in the passing game. He didn't get a lot of work. He averaged under 20 receiving yards a game. I'd like to see that happen, but we've been talking about that for years and it's in two years for Jacobs. And I just, I, I, I think he, he kind of is what he is, but it's not necessarily a bad thing because he's getting all those touchdowns. Maybe one last thing that would help him would be the Raiders defense getting better. And that would force the Raiders offense to be a little bit more run efficient, lean on Jacobs a little bit more, give him more opportunities um, on top of all that great red zone work. Yeah, and, and here's another thing I wanted to point out. Montgomery was was sixth in non-PPR, fourth in PPR. Jacobs was seventh in non-PPR, eighth in PPR. So they were both top eight. But if you compare 2019 versus 2020 and the running backs, like, like RB3 in 2020 was better than 2019, but that just at the top. But then like you look at RB6, in 2019, RB6 scored... 41 more points than RB6 in 2020. RB9 scored 18 more points in 2019. Mm-hmm. RB12 scored uh, scored 32 more points. Yeah, so, running back points were down in yeah. 2020. They yeah. were at a, actually, I, I have it right here. They were, it's like 15.9 PPR points per game for the top 12. 15.7, excuse me. So the top 12 running backs in PPR average 15.7 points per game. It's the lowest in over five years. The, wow. the previous low in 2017 was 16.2. Last year in 2019, it was 17.3. 2018, it was 18.1. I think you can chalk that up to a couple of things. One, the injuries to guys like McCaffrey and Barkley. Normally, those are top 12 running backs that put up boatloads of fantasy points. They were out of action. And two, we had a lot of rushing quarterbacks. And they pushed up the average, the top 12 average for that position to an all-time high, over 25 points per game for the top 12 quarterbacks in 2020. So I think that combination probably led to running back um, production being weaker than expected. And I wouldn't, you, you can't expect the rushing quarterbacks to slow down now. That's a part of NFL offenses. That's a growing part of the NFL. But you would hope that those running backs that were, injured last year, stay healthy next year. And the running backs that have potential, like all the rookies that in 2020, they grow and they develop and they're better in 2021. And guys like Jacobs get a better platform to be um, in position for a career year in 2021. All right. Josh Jacobs went with the eighth pick of round two in the PPR draft we did about a month ago. Would you take Josh Jacobs or James Robinson? I believe I have Robinson ranked higher than Jacobs. My last running back note that caught my eye, J.K. Dobbins. You know, this one caught my eye. J.K. Dobbins (laughs) led all running backs with six yards per carry. People are really excited about the player, and you should be. But are you excited about the opportunity? Because he just did not really get a lot of touches, even when in his last six games, which was over an eight-week span, and for him, he missed one game. Um but his last six games, he was the number six running back per game in non-PPR, number 11 in PPR. And he, in that stretch, he averaged 6.43 yards per carry. So incredibly efficient. He scored in every game. Uh, you know, should, who's the second best? Let me ask you this. Who's the second best rookie running back behind Jonathan Taylor? Oh, well, I guess you're going to say James Robinson. So who's third in 2021? In drafts, it goes Taylor, then Robinson, and then is it Dobbins? Uh, it's Acres for me because I think the opportunity is much clearer for him than it is for J.K. Dobbins. Let's just start with this: like you already know that when you're a Ravens running back, you're losing work to Lamar Jackson. Period. End of story. He was also losing work to Gus Edwards, and even in that type of a situation, um, you, you see the good in Dobbins, and you know that the talent is is awesome. 
and the production you talked about how he was at the end of the season. There were only four games in 2020 where a Ravens running back had 15 plus PPR points. Four. That's it. It's the second lowest in football. Only the Jets had fewer games from their running backs with 15 plus PPR points. It shocked me because you, you think about Dobbins and you think about that stretch toward the end of the season. And he was great. And he had that touchdown streak going. It was awesome. He had four runs. You talk about it. Did you mention his rushing average from his yeah. rookie year? It was oh, that's six what yards per carry. It's right. All it's, running backs, six yards per carry. Yeah. It's, it's huge. He had four runs of 30 plus yards, including a 72 yard touchdown run against Cincinnati. Actually, two of his four big runs were against Cincinnati. And he still averaged 4.8 yards per carry without them. 13% of his runs were for zero or negative yards. I don't, I don't think that's something to hold against him. No. He had 23 carries. I think, I, I think he's a stud too, but it's just where he is that makes him a problem. And he had 23 carries of three yards or fewer to go. That includes goal line carries. Just short yardage downs. He converted 17 of them. That's 74%. That's great. Gus Edwards had 39 carries of three yards or fewer to go, and he converted 32 of them. That's 82%. That's out of this world good. Goal to go, though. Gus Edwards, three of seven on those carries, you know, like a one yard goal line plunge, something like that, three yards or shorter from the end zone. Dobbins was six for six. So uh, there's going to be some interesting decisions made about how the Ravens move forward with their running backs, but Gus should be there. Dobbins is going to be there, and Lamar Jackson's going to be there. And I'm just worried there's not enough to go around to make Dobbins a fantasy dynamo and a top 12 type of running back. Love the talent. I love drafting him in round three in our early mocks. I would, I'm going to continue to do that, but I don't see him creeping into round two. All right, last question here real quick. Is Dobbins the third best? You know, he'll be a sophomore running back next year in non-PPR. I'm still going to say no to that. I'd still rather have Akers. All right. DJ Moore, we'll do the wide receiver stuff a little bit quicker so we can get to your senior bowl. Well, we have time. Um, DJ Moore, he has 10 touchdowns in three seasons, 335 targets, 10 touchdowns, no more than four touchdowns in any season. And that's just weird because he's been top 10 in receiving yards among wide receivers two straight years. Uh, very different kind of season this year, a lot fewer catches, much higher yards per catch. But again, the yards between 1,100 and 1,200, I think, two straight seasons for him, and he can't crack more than four touchdowns. What do you make of that? I mean, if he gets up to eight touchdowns, then you could be talking about a guy who we should be taking in the second round or something like that. Sure. Maybe the third, um, early third. How, yeah, so you, what do you think about Moore and those touchdowns? How many targets did you say he had in the last three years? 335. Do you know how many of them were red zone targets? Yes. Well, I can tell you in the last two years. I can tell you in the last three. Okay, go on. 28. Yeah. 28 red zone targets. Do you know how many catches? He's had in the last three years in the red zone? That I have no idea. 12. Wow. Do you know how many touchdowns he has in the red zone? That I bet you can tell me. 12 catches in the red zone, 10 touchdowns in his career. I'm going to say four. I think that's about right. I'd have to triple check one number from 2018. If you can give me a second. I didn't actually really write it down. It but it's low. Okay. He doesn't get a lot of work in the red zone. And it's even worse if you break it down inside the 10 yard line. He just, it's just an area that doesn't work out. And the mo here's the most pathetic stat of all in 2020, David Moore had more red zone targets and inside the 10 yard targets than DJ Moore. Well, here's another thing that's a problem. How many quarterbacks through 30 or more touchdowns this year? Uh, maybe you can look that up. Carolina has thrown 33 touchdown passes in their last two seasons combined. So they're not throwing for, they're not throwing touchdowns. That's hurting DJ Moore too. Now uh, in his rookie year, Cam Newton threw 28 or the team threw 28. Cam Newton had most of them. I don't know if he had all of them, but that was his rookie year, whatever. I don't judge wide receivers too harshly on their rookie year. The last two seasons, 33 touchdown passes. Are you kidding me? That is horrible. So they've got to get, they've got to upgrade there and it's not going to be easy to do. Mm -hmm. 10 quarterbacks through 30 plus touchdowns. That's yeah. just passing. That's Doesn't include rushing. Year. And Carolina had 33 in the last two years. And Carolina clearly trying to upgrade at the quarterback position. If they're dangling number eight to get Matthew Stafford, I, I think a, an upgrade at quarterback would do DJ Moore a lot of good, but there could be a philosophical thing there among two different coaching staffs that Carolina's had where 
they view DJ Moore as great playmaker between the twenties, but once you get inside the twenty, you go in a different direction. And if McCaffrey's yeah. back, that's going to take more targets away from him. Well, in the PPR draft we did now, this was a three receiver full PPR draft, and he still went 49th overall, first pick of round five. That's mm-hmm. DJ Moore. Guys who went ahead of him: Tyler Lockett, Amari Cooper, Deontay Johnson, T. Higgins to Dave. Robert Mm -hmm. Woods. So actually those were six consecutive picks. Woods, Higgins, Deontay Johnson, Cooper, Lockett, DJ Moore. He was the last of that group. And I I could, I I could see myself taking him over Lockett. And we could get to a point where you take him ahead of Cooper too. Okay. Just got to get those touchdowns up. All right. Next thing that uh, stood out to me, let me just see where Deandre Hopkins went. Hopkins. Um, is never, I don't know that he's ever in the discussion as the number two wide receiver for 2021. I mean, I think Adams is going to be consensus number one for now. Sure. Um, Hopkins was the third guy taken, and I took him. Unless I'm missing someone. Yeah, as Adams went sixth overall, then Tyreek Tyree has Hill to went be up 13. there. Hopkins went three picks later. But in a PPR league, you know, I'm not sure, sure you shouldn't take DeAndre Hopkins over Tyreek Hill. His first nine games, he was on pace, and this was healthy Kyler Murray. He was on pace for 119 catches, 1,531 yards, seven touchdowns on 156 targets. And then after the injury, he was still on pace for 165 targets and 110 catches, but the yards went way down, the, uh, the catch rate went way down, and Kyler just wasn't as good. But you're still talking about a guy who... Uh, finished with a ton of catches and um, you know, maybe honestly, like I feel like he, you could take him in the first round in a PPR league. And I, I think it'd be fine. He had 115 catches. It's insane. Uh, but only six touchdowns. But anyway, the splits were pretty interesting. Just the pace he was on before Kyler Murray got hurt. Dave, you're talking about 115 catches and over 1500 yards. The one note that I, sorry. Sure. The one note that I got was that before this Kyler injury, and remember the injury happened really early on in that second game against Seattle, and that is the last seven games of the season. uh, Kyler was averaging 8.16 intended air yards per game. After that game, 7.4. And some of those last seven games, Kyler looked like his old self. He looked okay. But in others, he did look tentative and didn't run as much. You could tell that something was bothering him. And I think that definitely took its toll on, on Hopkins' numbers. But I just stud receiver did a great job going to Arizona should continue to be very, very good for fantasy. And I think you can view him as a, a really great second round pick in fantasy. I don't think you should think of him as someone that you got to get in round one. Like I'm taking Kelsey ahead of him. That's, that's easy for sure. me. Yeah. I almost, you almost view him as, okay. I don't love any of the running backs that are left. Adams and Hill are gone. Kelsey's already gone. There's no chance I'm taking a quarterback. There's a safe pick. I'm taking DeAndre Hopkins. Okay. And then finally, the last wide receiver note that caught my eye was Adam Thielen had twice as many touchdown catches as Justin Jefferson. (laughs) Uh, Jefferson Jefferson crushed him in yards. Jefferson had, uh, I think, the third most yards in the NFL. But Thielen was among the NFL leaders in red zone targets, green zone targets, Mm -hmm. and 14 touchdown catches to only seven for Justin Jefferson. Does that matter to you, or do you think that's kind of fluky and will even itself out next season? I think it's a usage thing, very similar to DJ Moore. 13 of those 14 touchdowns for Adam Thielen were in the red zone. 10 of the 14 were inside the 10. Is that the green zone, Adam? Yeah. The inside the 10-yard line? Seven of the 14 touchdowns were inside the five. So he was taking scores away, theoretically, from Dalvin Cook at that point. Justin Jefferson only had eight targets inside the 10 zone. So Thielen had more touchdowns inside the 10 and Jefferson had targets inside the 10 Uh, Jefferson. Three of his touchdowns were in the red zone. One more was from the 20 exactly. So it doesn't count. And he had one touchdown from 10 yards out. Um, All the rest of them were bigger plays. We'll see if the Vikings adjust that in 2021. But I think that's, that's the last saving grace for Adam Thielen because he's, he's almost certain to be second in targets moving forward and second in yardage and, you know, be the the one B. If I'm being nice, he's really more of the two. But when they get in the red zone, as long as Kirk Cousins is the quarterback, Cousins is going to have full faith and confidence to go to Adam Thielen. And I think you can certainly pencil in Thielen for at least eight touchdowns next year. 
maybe you get lucky and he hits double digits. Would you rather have Thielen or more? I think the catches won't be that. Uh, they'll be kind of far off between the two, like maybe 20, 30 catches off between the two of them. Between Thielen that's and DJ Moore? Points. Yeah, I but think that's so. That's the thing about DJ Moore is he only had 66 catches this year. But I look at him and I still see him as a candidate for like 90. I know. Yeah, that's that's right. Because he was that kind of wide receiver in 2019. He had 87 catches. Mm-hmm. Has he has he changed that? Maybe he has. Maybe I'm overrating more a little bit in that regard. I think in full PPR, I'm still going to, I'm, I'm going to go with more over Thielen. Okay. All right. Thank you, Dave, for your thoughts on what caught my eye in 2020. We will take a break. When we come back, more of Dave's thoughts, this time on the senior bowl, the prospects that stood out, the ones you need to know as we still have a ways to go, but uh, plenty of time to talk about and get excited for the NFL draft. So we'll be right back on fantasy football today. It was senior bowl week this past weekend. Dave loves the senior bowl. He loves the senior bowl. Who did you love this year? Uh, not the offensive lineman. Uh, there were some that were really good, but uh, the game itself was just riddled with good pass rush and quarterbacks under pressure and running backs that couldn't go anywhere. Although one running back did go places, and that was Michael Carter from North Carolina, who really he, he carried over what he did at UNC, which is like surprisingly gifted tackle breaking running back given his size he's 57 202 uh he broke three tackles on one run in the senior bowl he caught a couple of passes in the senior bowl he scored a touchdown where uh he, it's from 12 yards out gets the handoff stays on his feet he starts getting like hit by a bunch of different defenders and then offensive linemen come and they like push him into the end zone it was like a mosh pit going into the end zone it was actually kind of funny but he scored on the play he was the best running back in the senior bowl game if you ask me and he had some really good practices as well don't see him being a feature back he's not going to be anywhere close to the same level as a Najee Harris or Travis Etienne uh, in the draft class but he could end up being a passing downs back in the NFL uh, a scat back type, maybe someone who does develop into a, a decent role landing spot. is huge for every running back certainly will be for him, but he's got talent. He stood out as, as the best running back uh, in the senior bowl. And I uh, just love the way that he can create yards after contact. Uh, well, I hope he can be more than just a third down back. You know, from a fantasy standpoint, we're not all that interested in those types of players. He averaged eight yards per carry this year and 308 yards in the last game. We saw him before the senior bowl. 24 carries, 308 yards, two touchdowns at Miami. He could not be stopped in that game. Yeah, and both of their – they have two good running backs. Uh, They both – I'll give you the stats if you guys want to know. They both had, like, ridiculous games. I think they ran for, like, 600 yards. Um, And he also had 214, I think, yards against Virginia Tech earlier in the year. So, hell of a senior season for Carter. Um, Yeah, Javante Williams in that Miami game had 23 carries for 236 yards. So, good defense, Miami. Um, You had a wide receiver, I know, that caught your eye. I had three that caught my eye, but the one that I liked the most was Amari Rogers from Clemson. And if you've watched Trevor Lawrence play, this has been his number one target. It's a slot receiver, just a real quick twitch type of athlete, very fast. But he made a couple of really tough grabs in the senior bowl. One was a touchdown where he, he had to leap for the ball, caught it, took a hit, landed, held onto the ball. Almost the exact same thing happened on a two-point conversion later on in the game. Just seems to be like a good, reliable slot receiver type in the NFL who might be able to develop beyond that. I've, I've said that same type of thing for A.J. Brown and Debo Samuel in the past, and I wonder if Amari Rogers could be that same type of guy. Uh, he's 5'9", he's 2'11". How physical can he be? I, I think he proved in the Senior Bowl that he can be. Could be a nice high volume asset in PPR. Uh, I think I'm going to land on him being a top 20 overall pick in dynasty drafts. And if he goes to the right team where he's going to play right away, uh, goodness, he'd probably end up being a first round pick, a late first round pick in dynasty rookie only drafts. All right. Amari Rogers for Clemson. And uh, who are the other wide receivers? That Demetric like? Felton was an interesting one. He played a lot of running back at UCLA, but he worked out as a wide receiver at the senior bowl. Uh, he looked good. He scored on a red zone stop route. He flashed speed on a slot route. It's the type of player that you can line up anywhere, but get the most out of probably as a wide receiver, a little bit smaller than uh, and leaner than Amari Rogers, but someone who could be very good and be a good complimentary receiver at the next level. Des Fitzpatrick is a little bit different. He's 6'2", 202, but he, 
he moves like he's 5'10", 195. He's got really good quick twitch for a bigger guy. He's got juice to make plays after the catch. Um, had a couple of drops in the senior bowl, but definitely is someone to keep an eye on. Again, this is going to be a loaded wide receiver class. Jamar Chase, Devontae Smith, those guys are going to be the absolute studs. There's going to be other ones behind them. Dwayne Eskridge is another one who's you know kind of a, a short, shifty receiver. Was at the senior bowl, didn't play in the senior bowl game, um, but – once you get past those guys, and once you get past Rodgers too, guys like Des Fitzpatrick and uh, and, and Demetric Felton could come into play. They'll have a chance to be useful fantasy options. So I'm excited about them. They look good. I can't wait to see um, how the the rest of the lead up to the draft goes, and then where they end up getting drafted. Yeah, uh, Chris Trapasso on CBSSports.com, his most recent mock draft from just a couple of days ago, has seven wide receivers in the first round. So this is going to be an awesome year for rookie wide receivers. Mm-hmm. Can't wait. It's just going to, it's going to deepen the position. And certainly in the case of Chase and Smith, those guys are NFL ready. And a lot of the receivers that were, we considered NFL ready. Look, some of them took off as rookies. Others, it took them a little bit longer. Case of Jerry Judy, we're still going to wait, but we're optimistic about him in 2021. We're, we're getting spoiled now. We're getting a lot of really great receivers that could make shrewd fantasy managers maybe wait on that position a little bit once the the elite and the near elite tiers are off the board on draft day and let's be honest here with the senior bowl most of the most of the first round picks are not seniors so <laughs> right. underclassmen so but they were there for the week you know Devonte smith was there for the week Najee harris was there for the week they didn't play in the game right but uh, they were there Kadarius tony i'm not sure if he's a senior or not but he's he was he is, outstanding actually. in practice. He was outstanding in practice. He's a wide receiver out of Florida. He is a senior. He and an absolute stud, gifted feet, great speed, uncoverable. Uh, I don't know if I'm ready to say that he's just like Henry Ruggs, but we'll, we'll get an idea of that as we move forward. But he's absolutely someone that's like maybe in that second tier of great receivers in this draft class, realizing that that first tier, A, is very small, and B, is, has receivers that just are going to be or figure to be just dynamite wide receiver ones in the NFL. Okay. The, the one I really want to hear more about from, you know, the Emory hunts of the world when we get these draft experts on and Ryan Wilson, whoever we're talking to is, is Devonte Smith, not a senior, obviously, but Heisman trophy winner. He's got to be the best wide receiver. I, I mean, I don't even know how long it, it's a, he's incredible yes. jaw dropping player. So, and he's coming from the same school as Calvin Ridley awesome. and Jerry Judy. And we went crazy for those guys. I know you loved Ridley when he came yes, out. Yes, I did. And I, he's better than them. Yeah, he is small. That's People are going to be concerned about that. Yep. Um, he's, but he's just, I list as 6'1", 175, but he, he just looks kind of small out there. Mm-hmm. It's true, yeah, but he's, he's just he's a player. He's absolutely a player and a gamer. And easily see him being a top eight pick in the NFL draft and a top five pick in rookie only drafts, if not like three. Oh, if not number one. I mean, I think. Well, I think the running backs are still going to be really popular. And it always, when it comes to dynasty rookie drafts, it comes down to what you need. Yeah. I mean, I love Travis Etienne, and that would be my guess that I would take him first. We'll see. I've started to see a little bit more of Harris and. Me too. I don't know. I love Etienne, but sure. It depends where they end up. They're Mm -hmm. they're not going to be drafted far apart. I would imagine in the NFL draft, but. You know, I, I, a lot of people just have that philosophy of taking a wide receiver instead of a running back in a dynasty league. So I, I would imagine in a one QB league that some people will take. Maybe, maybe it's not Devonte Smith. You know, maybe it's Jamar Chase. One of those two guys as number one mm-hmm. will depend on fit. Oh, sure. For sure. It usually does. A lot of Miami Dolphins taking uh, Devonte Smith because of the Tua connection and whatnot. Um, OK, Dave, let's read some emails. Fantasy football. At CBSI.com. This is Jason from a small Virginia town with tons of Civil War history. Uh, Richmond is sure. like the biggest Virginia town. I don't have any oh. small Virginia town. Does Blacksburg have a lot of Civil War history? I don't know, but I'm not a big fan of Blacksburg. No. They were very mean to me when I went there. Very mean. Not nice to the University of Miami people. Dear Jerry, Terrell, JJ, and Randy. 
So those are the four best wide receivers ever. Jerry Rice, Terrell Owens, J.J. Ortega-Whiteside, and Randy Moss. <laughs> uh, I love the podcast. I'm in an 18, eight-team non-PPR keeper league. I can keep six of them. So who do you throw back? doesn't appear there are any rounds attached here. Barkley, Jonathan Taylor, Swift, Akers, Ridley, Metcalf, Lamb, oh, and Kittle. I got to throw back two of these guys, huh? Barkley, Taylor, Swift, Akers, Ridley, Metcalf, Lamb, Kittle. It's non-PPR, so I think that hurts Lamb. I think that hurts Lamb, too. You just hate getting rid of a young talent like that. Yeah. All right, well, let's start with the obvious guys that you're keeping. You're definitely going to keep Barkley and Taylor. I think you got to keep Ridley and Metcalf. So from Swift, Akers, Lamb, and Kittle, you got to keep two? Yeah. I think I'm keeping Kittle and Akers. Final answer. All right, good. This is from John. Where is he from? Oh, from Virginia. Probably um, Clifton. Yeah. So uh, considering some potential off-season trades, would you rather, who would you rather have in a half PPR keeper league? Dobbins or Swift? Higgins or Lamb? Half PPR keeper league, Dobbins or Swift? Higgins or Lamb? I'm going to say Swift over Dobbin. Am I going to say that? I think I'm going to say that because of the half PPR element. And I'm expecting Swift to get a lot of catches in this new offense. I don't know if I'm going to stick with that all the way through the summer, but that's where I'm at right now. We talked a lot about Dobbins today and why he's not like talent. He's a 10, but you're, the situation just isn't great for him, and he doesn't catch a lot of passes. He could. He just doesn't. Higgins or Lamb, I like Higgins' upside to be an amazing number one wide receiver. I expect that to happen sooner than Lamb gets there. I love them both, though. Okay, so next question is from... Oh, no, P.S. from John. What mm-hmm. are the odds that the Falcons draft Najee Harris to be their Derrick Henry for Arthur Smith? With the number four overall pick in the draft, approximately 0.0%. Right. But if they move down a bunch or move back up into late round one to grab Harris, sure, that, that would solve their running back issues. That would, that would, that would be a, a very nice landing spot for Najee Harris. I'm trying to look up all of the Falcons picks. One more thing. like I'm not sure if Arthur Smith must have a big bully running back. Like that's going to be one of the most fascinating things that we'll learn about him is did he just adapt to what he had and he made the most of it? And can he do the exact same thing in Atlanta and just lean on Matt Ryan in that passing game? Who wouldn't do that? You'd be dopey to not do that. Who looks at that passing game and says, well, we need to get a running back to run the ball 25 times a game. We'll see what they obviously have to make an improvement at running back. I just, I think Arthur Smith is probably deserves credit for being uh, innovative enough to work with whatever he's got and not necessarily, you know, a system with a big bulky running back. Last email is from another man named John. Where's he from? Reno, Nevada. I have a series of trades that I made recently in a 12 team PPR dynasty league. You start two flexes. I had the 101, 203, and 204, and 205 picks. I okay. sent Tyler Boyd and pick 203 for DJ Moore. I like it. I, I sent Jerry Judy for 109 and 301. And then I, I don't sent, know if I love that one. And then I sent 109, 204, and 205 for 103. I so like that now, one. Now I have 101, 103, and 301. He started out with 101, two, 203, 204, and 205. Um, I, I, I'm always going to be a fan of this. Yeah. I don't love giving up Judy though. No, I don't. But now he's got one one and one Oh three. Uh, he, he could potentially get Jamar chase and Devonte Smith. That would make me forget about Jerry Judy pretty quickly in my dynasty league. But what he's probably going to end up doing is taking one running back and one wide receiver. He's going to get his pick of whatever running back he wants at one one And then who's ever left from chase and Smith at one Oh three. So nice you, moves. They like it. Good moves, John. Okay. Man, why is it so hard to find the picks for every team in the draft? This can't be that hard, right? You mean you don't know off the top of your head? No, I don't. Like, how can I find? Oh, Atlanta's got these picks. I did a lot of googling here. 
Schrager, where the hell are you, man? <laughs> Making me look doing the same Google search you're doing, and it's not Mark, easy. You're trying to find out what picks the Falcons have in 2021? Yeah, yeah, yeah. All right, go ahead. Google fight! Here we go, ladies and gentlemen. I already tried this one. It didn't work. Okay, so they have got... It? It. Yeah. You did? Yeah, I think I got it. Okay, good luck. What do you got? Hold on, I got to make sure I'm right. <laughs> yeah. Who cares? I got it. They've got the fourth pick in round one, uh, 35th overall pick in round two, so an early round two pick, early round three pick, okay, and then uh, early round four pick. They've got an early pick in rounds one through six. Four, 35, 68, 99, 132, 163. Bingo. How'd you find that? Where? What website? Uh, it's a little site called AtlantaFalcons.com. I was on there. Well, you didn't look hard enough. I guess not. Okay, well, thanks to Dave Richard, Ben Schrager, and to all of you for listening. We will uh, talk to you tomorrow with an early free agency preview and more on Fantasy Football Today. Want more of the Fantasy Football Today podcast and nonstop year-round fantasy advice? It's simple. Hit the subscribe button and hang with us all throughout the year.